Today is entitled Time No Longer. This deals with the origin and purpose of the Great Second Advent Movement. It's an exposition of the tenth chapter of the great book of Revelation. And this is how it reads I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. In prophecy, an angel denotes a message, a message of God. A mighty angel denotes a message of great power. And it says he came down from heaven, denoting its origin, its heavenly origin. In the book of Revelation, uh, movements of God are portrayed as coming from above, but movements of the great enemy are represented as emerging from beneath. And this corresponds with what James says in his epistle, chapter 3. He says, This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, etc., so there you have the significance of coming from heaven, you see. And who is this angel? What is this message that's symbolized here? It says he's clothed with a cloud. And often in scripture, clouds represent the presence of the deity. You see, so the Godhead is involved here. And a rainbow upon his head. This was a, is a true halo denoting deity divinity and it tells us that this angel is one of the Godhead and we will show that it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified state his face it says were as that was as the Sun this also represents deity for in first Timothy 6 the Apostle Paul speaking of the King of Kings dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto Friends, this represents Jesus Christ in his glorified state as the God-man, you see. Jesus Christ, the God-man. And uh, the fact that this angel is Christ declares how important is this chapter. And many ask, why is it that Jesus Christ is presented here as an angel, when in fact he is forever the God-man, you see. Now in the Old Testament, before his incarnation, before he was made flesh, he was often pictured as an angel. He was, uh, one of his titles was Michael, the archangel. The word Michael means who is like God. The New Testament shows that the only one like God, the expressed image of his person, is God the Son, Jesus, you see. And archangel means chief angel or commander of the angels. And this gives us the position of Christ during the Old Testament times. Some believe that in, his, in the steps of his condescension, Jesus Christ took on several forms. In the Old Testament, it was the form of an angel. But in the New Testament, my friends, it was the form of a man. God, the God-man, you see. So then, much for that. And he had it in his hand, it says, a little book open. Open. What's this little book, friends? This book, it shows, was none other than the book of Daniel. There are four reasons. It's a little book. The book of Daniel contained just 12 chapters. The emphasis on the word open. He had a little book open. And the emphasis on open indicates that it wasn't always open. It was closed, you see. Book of Daniel. 
And the only book in the Bible that was closed up and sealed was the book of Daniel. Oh, but thou, O oh Daniel, shut up the words and close the book. Daniel 12, 4. Again, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then the fourth, the third reason, the angel swore an oath before God that time would be no longer. Friends, that oath comes from the 12th chapter of Daniel and verse 7. You see, it's quoting from that Daniel. And the fourth point, the little book is concerned with time. For he says, time, and reading the book, he says, time shall be no longer. And friends, the book of Daniel specializes on the question of time. It majors on time. The famous time periods of prophecy. And uh, it says that, the book, of, that the, the book of Daniel will be sealed till the time of the end. Seal the book, it says, even to the time of the end. Twice it says that. When's the time of the end? It's the period, my friends, prior to the second coming of Christ. We often allude to it as the last days. And some say, oh, they've been saying that we're in the last days for years. And that is true, we have. And six times the book of Daniel speaks of the time of the end. And Daniel, the book of Daniel, reveals when the time of the end commenced. For notice, Daniel 11.35, They that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by, cap by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. These were the days of persecution of the dark ages. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end. The time of persecution would bring us to the time of the end. And friends, this refers to the time of papal supremacy when millions of Christians were martyred for their faith. And that period ended in 1798. And that date, my friends, marks the time of the end, the last days of the world's history. So you see, we've been in the last days for a quite a time. And now, actually, we are in the last of the last days, as other lectures will show. And it indicates here in this prophecy that in 1798, the book of Daniel would be unsealed, you see. For it says, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That means increased concerning the book. And friends, as a result of the increase of knowledge of Daniel, there rose a great revival of prophetic study, the study of the prophecies. And the 10th chapter of Revelation foretold this great revival. As one commentator of the time declared, quote, since 1798 the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment. And then the prophecy says, he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This indicates that his message would go over land and sea. It would be international. You see, it would be worldwide, would be this great message of revival. And then it says, he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. The roar of the lion in the forest creates terror. And my friends, the sounding of this great message would, would bring about uh, uh, godly fear in the hearts of many people which it surely did. Now notice the point, the pointed message of this angel. The angel, it says, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that lives forever that there should be time no longer. He's reading, he's declaring from the book of Daniel and he says, time shall be no longer. What's he mean by this time? What kind of time? The end of the world? No, because later it says you must pre prophesy or preach again before many peoples, nations and tongues. Was it the close of probation, the close of the gospel? 
No, because he says in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God should be finished. The mystery of God is the gospel. You see, so it doesn't refer to the closing work of the gospel. So, is it the end of symbolic time? Of a day for a year? Some believe it does. No, it can't. Because, my friend, symbolic time in symbolic prophecy extends right down to the second advent of Christ. At the second advent of Christ, symbol cease. That's why when it talks about the thousand years of the millennium in Revelation 20, which is after the second advent, it is universally understood as 1,000 literal years, not symbolic years, you see. So, uh, it, so it can't be, can't be the end of symbolic time, as, as some would have it. So what time is it, my friends? Let the book of Daniel answer. And the book of Daniel, we find, specializes in great time prophecies. This is peculiar to his book. He presents unique time periods in prophecy. And these consist of great chronological periods of time. There are five unique chronological periods in the book of Daniel. There's the 1260 days, the 70 weeks, the 1290 days, the 1335 days, and the greatest of all, the 2300 day period. This is the longest and the most important chronological period of the book of Daniel. And that period ended in 1844 AD, as we will indisputably show in later lectures. And friends, this means that there is no prophetic time after 1844. No dates can be set after 1844. All date setting finished in 1844. And anyone setting a date in connection with the second advent of Christ after 1844, dismiss it. For there's no such thing, no such date after 1844. All prophetic time ended in 1844. Time shall be no longer, declared the angel. So this refers then to prophetic times. And this marks the date when this message of Revelation 10 came to the world, 1844. For at no other time could it be, be declared the time is no longer, you see. Now, why the strange call in this prediction for John, the writer, to eat the book of Daniel? For notice what the angel said to him. Go, take the little book. I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Verses 8 and 9 of Revelation 10. My friends, what's the significance of eating this little book, the book of Daniel? This is a Bible term for the study and acceptance of truth. You see, as the, the psalmist said, How sweet are thy words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And Jeremiah the prophet said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was to me the joy of mine heart. You see, so it's, a, it, it's an expression denoting mental Mental assimilation. We use the same expression today. We speak of the reader's digest. You see, something we mentally digest, mentally assimilate, you see. So, eating the book symbolized the experience of those who mentally digested the book of Daniel and responded to its message, you see. So, what was it that led scholars at that time to investigate the book of Daniel? Let's answer this. It was sparked by the terrible French Revolution of 1789. The French Revolution. That revolution, my friends, when it erupted at that time, it involved a ferocious attack 
upon the Bible and the Christian faith. And so severe was the assault that it brought a deep reaction from the surrounding nations of Europe. In the revolution, France not only defied God and rejected the Christian faith, she rose up also in rebellion against the papal church, which had dominated France for centuries, remember, and had really hurt the people. And Italy was invaded, the Pope was arrested, and the papal government was abolished. This was a momentous event, and it aroused tremendous interest in the prophecies of the Bible by those uh, in, in the world of that day. As Dr. Ali Froome, in his monumental work, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 3, 263, declares, the French Revolution was like the explosion of the long, pent-up fires of a volcano. The papal church and state were suddenly torn from their foundation and overwhelmed in the common ruin. The sudden and violent shock sent the Protestant church back to the prophecies. Get that? Back to the prophecies, you see. And uh, in what way? In what way was the revival of prophetic study achieved? My friends, around 1798, various scholars, independently of each other, were led to investigate the predictions of Daniel the prophet and also the prophecies of the book of Revelation. For remember in Daniel it said at that time that knowledge would be increased concerning the book, you see, at the time of the end, 1798. And it's interesting to notice the, uh, that the general conclusion concerning the 1260 year period which they first studied, most scholars agreed that it terminated in 1798 when these world-shaking events took place. In that year, the papal government was abolished and that momentous event rocked the world of the day, as you can imagine. Uh, there you have a painting from the Vatican picturing General Berthier of, of the French uh, armies arresting the Pope. So, but, but then after this, of course, came the, 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 the study, the investigation of the major time period of that, uh, in the book of Daniel. And that time period was the 2,300 day period. And it, it reads in Daniel 8, 14, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And as they studied that, the majority of the scholars came to the conclusion that this time period ended between 1843 and 1847. That was the general conclusion. And friends, this prediction created a revival of belief in the second advent of Christ. Up till this time, the second advent was not hardly mentioned. It wasn't uh, featured in the teaching of the Christian church, you see. And, uh, but at this time, Christians of many persuasions were involved in the great revival. It commenced in Britain and then spread to Europe, India, across to Asia, and then to North America, where it blossomed. It was called the Great Second Advent Movement, and it, and it involved believers in almost every Protestant church of the day, the Great Second Advent Movement. As the British historian Thomas Macaulay declared, in his critical and miscellaneous essays of 1844, he said, Many Christians believe that the Messiah will shortly establish a kingdom upon the earth and reign visibly over all its inhabitants. Whether this doctrine be orthodox or not, we shall not here inquire. The number of people who hold to it is very much greater than the number of Jews residing in England. Many of those who hold it are distinguished by rank, wealth and ability. It is preached from the pulpits both of the Scottish and the English church. Noble men and members of parliament have written in defence of it. That's Thomas B. Macaulay who lived from 1800 to 1859. And at this time, my friends, this revival brought uh, or, or, or led to the 
to the uh, formation of the Second Advent Conferences. These were a series of conferences by leading scholars uh, uh, in regard to the Second Advent. And uh, these were held in the mansion of the wealthy London banker and Member of Parliament, Henry Drummond, the man who was famous for writing that book that was popular for a century, Love, the Greatest Thing in the World. And this was at Albury Park, Guildford, Surrey, England. And uh, the Second Advent Conferences went from 1826 until 1830. These students of the prophecies were not detached dreamers, but they were men of ability. They were active men of affairs. They, they, two of them were Anglican clergymen, two were Presbyterian ministers, three were members of the legal profession, and two were aristocrats of wealth and position. Now, this great Second Advent movement, my friends, which began in Britain, began to spread. And between 1820 and 1833, over 70 publications were produced in Britain on apocalyptic topics, as they called it, because they had to do with the apocalypse, you see, the advent of Christ. And these were distributed in various parts of the world, and as a result, religious revival sprang up in various parts of the world of that day, emphasizing the second advent of Christ. Among that, or rather, in England itself, uh, over 700 Anglican clergymen were involved in proclaiming the message of the second advent of Christ. And it certainly spread around the world. And uh, it involved in this revival, or rather involved in this revival, was one particular person called Joseph Wolfe, who lived from 1795 to 1862. He was called the missionary to the world. A remarkable man, uh, the world's most noted missionary traveller and linguist, he was termed. He was born a Jew. He was convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was the true Messiah as a result of reading Isaiah 53, the chapter, remember, with the Jews are forbidden to read by their rabbis. But he read it as a young, as a youth, and was convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Messiah. At 17 years, he became a Catholic. At 21 years, the Pope, uh, Pope Pius VII placed him in the Collegia Romana in Rome. But soon he turned to the Protestant faith and moved to England. And he was appointed as the representative of the London Society for the Promotion of Christianity Among the Jews. He was accomplished in 14 language, languages, expert in six, and at 26 years of age he began his missionary exploits proclaiming the Second Advent. He labored in Palestine, Sinai Peninsula, Mesopotamia, Persia, Crimea, Georgia, and the Ottoman Empire for six years. Returning to Britain, he preached in Britain, Holland, Germany, Mediterranean, the Greek islands, in Egypt, Jerusalem, and Cyprus. Then for another four years, he labored in Turkey, Persia, Turkestan, Bokhara, Belk, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Hindustan, and the Red Sea area. Tremendous. In a letter to Bishop Doan of the Anglican Church, he said, An invisible power had continually carried me from land to land to preach the tidings of salvation and the second coming of our Lord in glory and majesty. How about that? And uh, while at Bokhara, he reported, quote, The Arabs of this place have a book called Sirah, which treats of the second coming of Christ, and his reign in glory. How about that? And then in another place, he says, I spent six days with the children of Rechab, Rechab the Rechabites, that, come, that you know, came from uh, the Old Testament times. They drink no wine, plant no vineyard, sow no seed, live in tents, and remember the word of Jonadab, the son of Rechab. <clears throat> with them were children of Israel of the tribe of Dan, who reside near Tirim in Hatramort who expect in common with the children of Rechab the speedy arrival of the Messiah in the clouds of heaven. So right away over in the Middle East, my friends, there were primitive people who held the belief of the soon return of Jesus Christ. Finally, Wolf um, preached in the United States 
and uh, even before the United Houses of Congress. And uh, the record tells us that ex-president John Quincy Adams uh, wrote that one of the most re that Wolf was one of the most remarkable men living on the earth at this time. A more profound, closely reasoned, and convincing argument on the proofs of Christianity, he said, it had never been his lot to listen to. And uh, Wolf played an important part in the Albury conferences at, at, in Sussex on the question of the Second Advent. He died in 1860 at 67 years of age. But sadly, in Britain, the great Second Advent movement was hindered and did not come to completion. But in spite of that setback, the prediction of Revelation 10 was fulfilled. The movement climaxed in the United States. The literature published in Britain was regularly forwarded to the United States and there the message spread throughout the churches of that, of that nation. And finally, under a Baptist layman named William Miller, a powerful preacher, the message reached its peak in that country. And supported by 3,000 clergy and thousands of lay people, the message of the return of Christ was proclaimed with tremendous power and hundreds of thousands were deeply moved. Deeply moved. And what did they proclaim? They proclaimed that the return of Christ was due about 1844. And this was based on the prediction, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What was the sanctuary? Back in that day, they erroneously believed that the sanctuary was the earth, or maybe Palestine, you see. And so, seeing that scripture indicates that the sec at the second advent the earth will be cleansed by fire, they concluded, that in 1844, or thereabouts, Christ would return to the earth and cleanse it with fire. So 1844, they concluded, must be the return of Christ. And this had a powerful effect upon the population of the day. Thousands listened, thousands believed and prepared. They forsook their sins and in repentance they sought the mercy of God. It was a tremendous movement. On the other hand, of course, some scoffed and misrepresented the message. But the opposition actually aided in its spread. I remember in Auckland, New Zealand, in 1938, I noticed in an Auckland newspaper uh, an excerpt from the edition of 1844 and it, in which it stated that numbers of people in the north of the country were in great expectation of the second advent on a certain day of that year, 1844. How about that? The advent movement, the great second advent, had reached even New Zealand, way down in the South Pacific. And when I was in Adelaide, uh, back in 1944, in a local magazine, I again noticed they had published a report of 100 years before, 1844, that numbers of Christians among the German settlers in the Barossa Valley were expecting the second advent on a certain day of that year, 1844. How about that? So, my friends, the message of the second advent, it went round the world. It is said that it went to every mission station on the globe. And remember, at that time, the great era of foreign missions was at its peak, you see. Now, it's interesting to notice that the prophecy had stated that when the prophet would eat the little book, when he would study it and absorb it, you see, it says, it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Verse 9, sweet as honey. And was this true? It surely was. The anticipation of the coming of Christ meant to them as the scripture says, there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. It meant the trials of life would be over. Oh, how sweet. 
and uh, that they would inherit eternal bliss. But the prophecy also said in verse 9, it shall make thy belly bitter. In other words, when they first studied it, their conclusions would be sweet, but when that got down to its final, final conclusion, it would be bitter, you see. And did this come true? It certainly did. When the day arrived for the actual coming of Christ in glory, what happened? We all know. It brought bitterness, for it didn't occur. It didn't occur. When the day arrived for the predicted event, there was great disappointment and devastation with thousands of people. The outcome, my friends, was disappointment. And this is spoken of in history as the great disappointment, and it surely was. The great majority who had responded at that time turned away from religion and lost interest in the truth of the second advent and also in other things concerning the, the Christian faith. And uh, among the churches, the study of prophecy was ne neglected and even opposed from that day on. And this explains, my friends, why the study of Bible prophecy uh, is missing in the teaching of the average church today. And it's been so for many years, ever since 1844, since the Great Disappointment. We can understand that, but, it's not, but it, is, uh, it, 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 is, it was a mistake. Because, my friends, the Bible was not in error. Man had heard. Man had made the mistake. Man had misinterpreted the Bible. He had failed to fully read the Bible. And that's generally the cause, you see, of so many differences and mistakes in interpretation of it. And you remember, Christ had warned. He said, but of that day and hour, speaking of his return, knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 46, verse 36. And you know, it's strange that even today there are some who still endeavour to set dates for the second advent of Christ. And my friends, if ever you hear of anyone setting a date, dismiss him, dismiss it, because it is not so. No man knows the day or the hour of the second advent of Christ. Seventh-day Adventists, they have specialised in this, on the second advent of Christ, but they have never set a date for the coming of Christ, and never will, you see, because of these things, of these, of these declarations in Scripture. Those who made the mistake in 1844 were what we might call first-day Adventists. They were Sunday keepers. They uh, were called Millerites because Miller, uh, William Miller, was their leader, you see, and uh, he led in that powerful movement. Now, it's important to note that both sides of the religious world of that day were mistaken. They were all mistaken in regard to their conclusions. The religious opposition to the Millerites was also greatly mistaken. In opposing the Millerites, they claimed that while 1844 was the correct date, it was not the second advent, but the setting up of the kingdom of God on earth. And that too was error, erroneous. They claimed the world would now advance, that the world would be converted, that God's kingdom would be established on earth. And has it been? My friends, the world has gotten worse and worse in regard to its conditions. And the mainline churches of Christendom still believe that same error. They are still mistaken, my friends. So, the... Uh, the Millerites have been unfairly treated by historians in regard to this event. Their mistake has been publicised and ridiculed, but the equally bad mistake of the churches in general that oppose them is hushed up, and it's been very unfair. And uh, the world, as we know, instead of becoming more Christian as they claimed it would be, 
has worsened to such a degree that civilization now is coming to a crisis. We are in the end of the time of the end. We're in the last of the last days of world's history. So what was the outcome of the disappointment of 1844? My friends, a minority of the Millerites, they knew that God had led them. Thousands upon thousands had been led to Christ. Lives had been dramatically changed. Sin had been forsaken. And only divine truth can do that, you see. So what did they do? They turned back to the Bible for meaning. They searched the Bible for an answer. And friends, that where is a great lesson. Whenever disappointment comes to us in the religious realm, let's go back to Scripture, back to the Bible. Because God had not made a mistake, remember. The Bible had not made a mistake. Man had made the mistake. Man's interpretation was wrong, you see. And so they turned back to the Bible for explanation. And a sincere minority of the Millerites re-studied the prophecies. And again they found that 1844 was correct. Even the opposition admitted that date was correct. And so they looked again at the prediction, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? As they prayed for guidance, light came to them in regard to the identity of the sanctuary. They were mistaken as to what was the sanctuary up till this time, you see. And the prophecy of Revelation 10 had foretold this. For it said, Thou must prophesy or preach again before many peoples, nations and tongues. But how could they preach again when they had made, were mistaken, you see? And then the prophecy brings to view the solution to the problem. And the next verse reads, and there's no break in the scripture here as in our versions, there's a break in the chapter here. It, it, it starts a new chapter. But in the original, there's no break. And so it says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without or outside it, that outside the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Now what temple was this that the angel referred to? In 1844, there was no official temple of God on earth. The popular view of the day, as I mentioned before, was that the sanctuary was the earth, or Palestine, the Holy Land, you see. So what and where is God's sanctuary or temple in the Christian era? What does scripture tell us in regard to the sanctuary or temple? My friends, at that time, God's people were in darkness concerning the truth of the temple or the sanctuary. In darkness. They knew of Solomon's temple, the Jewish temple, Herod's temple. They were aware of the Mosaic sanctuary in the wilderness for 40 years that served the children of Israel in the desert of Sinai. You see, they knew about that. But remember, the angel said, rise and measure the temple. Now, the Greek word for temple is naos. <clears throat> and it represents the temple as a whole with its two great divisions. The holy place and the most holy place. And then it says, <clears throat> there was given me a reed like to a rod. And he said, rise and measure the temple. That word for measure is kana in the Greek. And from it we get our word canon, C-A-N-O-N. Not the Howitzer canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, but canon, C-A-N-O-N. And this denotes a rule or law, 
a standard of order, of doctrine, or discipline. And it's used in the theological world of the Bible. And it's spoken of as the canon of Scripture, the rule or order of Scripture. The canon of Scripture, you see, meaning the authority of Scripture. So what this meant was, take the Scripture, take the canon of Scripture, and measure the temple. Measure the temple. The Greek word for measure there is metrosom. And when it's applied to a building or an object, it means preserve or restore. So what the text is saying, take the scripture and restore the temple or sanctuary. Restore it, you see. Why restore it? Because the knowledge of the sanctuary had been lost to mankind. That's why. In what way had the truth of the temple been lost to mankind? My friends, this loss was foretold by Daniel the prophet when he revealed that the little horn power, the Antichrist, would be responsible for it. And notice what he says in Daniel 8, verse 11, it says, He, the little horn, magnified himself even to the prince of the host, that is to Christ. And from him, from the prince, from Christ, the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Daniel 8, verse 11, the marginal reading, which is according to the Hebrew. It says the daily was taken away. That word daily refers to the daily priestly ministry, the continual priestly ministry in the sanctuary, in the heavenly sanctuary. And it refers to Christ's continual mediation in heaven above on behalf of his people. Now, this truth, the Antichrist took away from mankind. And this was when there emerged the great counterfeit of the gospel in the early years of the Christian faith. There emerged this great counterfeit. And this counterfeit, my friends, was the papal apostasy. The papal apostasy. And it involved as, some have, as one has said, a counterfeit God in a counterfeit temple with a counterfeit sacrifice, the Mass, by a counterfeit priest at a counterfeit altar in a counterfeit mediation. My friends, Christ's continual mediation for men in the heavenly sanctuary was lost to God's people by the deceptive work of the Antichrist of the book of Daniel and of Revelation. Now, this prediction of Revelation, or yes, Revelation 10, also said, restore the temple and the altar. The altar. What altar? The altar of incense. And this represented the mediation of the priest, you see? The mediation of Christ. And so, my friends, the truth of the heavenly sanctuary and the continual mediation of Christ, our high priest, was rediscovered in 1844. And that was the key to the great disappointment of that time. It explained why the Christians in general were so mistaken in regard to their understanding of the sanctuary. And it explained why the Lord permitted such a great disappointment. For it was this that, that uh, shook them to such a degree that they had to reinvestigate the scripture and find the truth in regard to the heavenly sanctuary. So my friends, in 1844, true believers found the lost truth of the heavenly sanctuary and the mediation of Christ. And when they began to read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, this is what they found. We have such an high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. 
and alluding to the Jewish priesthood, they read, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. See, the Jewish priesthood was a figure or type of the priesthood of Christ in heaven above. And again they read, but Christ being come and high priest by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Again they read, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, the earthly temple, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So there it was, and my friends, that was what they discovered. And so what was the outcome of the discovery of this lost truth? Notice the instruction as given in this prediction of Revelation 10. It says, thou must prophesy or preach again. You must go back to the world. You must proclaim the truth again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now they had the truth, you see, and they could now go to the world and proclaim the truth in regard to the sanctuary. And this was fulfilled to the very letter. Genuine believers, realizing God was leading them, began to proclaim the new truth and tremendous success has attended their efforts. A great movement developed. It began to spread overseas. Publishing houses were set up in various countries. Health centers were established. Church buildings were erected. And this movement, my friends, today is the most widespread Protestant movement in the world. Not in numbers, but in extent, you see. And the, and the purpose of its rise? To prepare the way for the return of Christ. To it has been given the responsibility of bearing to all men the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. And this is the final message of God to mankind. This is the message, my friends, that will prepare you and me and everyone else, everyone who receives it, we will prepare him for the glorious return of our blessed Saviour. May I encourage you to look into this and to appreciate the great Second Advent movement is my sincere prayer. Amen.